Good evening, everybody. I'm Professor Charlie Jeffrey, Vice Chancellor and President here at the University of York. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're very pleased that so many of you are joining us to mark Holocaust Memorial Day 2024. Holocaust Memorial Day is commemorated across the globe on the 27th of January, and we observe this annual occasion at the University of York by holding events and talks that bring people together to remember the millions of people murdered in the Holocaust and in the genocide since, including in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. Each year, the Holocaust Memorial Trust selects a theme, a provocation of sorts, and the theme for 2024 is fragility of freedom. Freedom means different things to different people, but with every genocide that has taken place, those who were targeted for persecution have had their freedom restricted and removed before many of them were murdered. The gradual removal of freedom is often a slow-moving and pernicious process. In 1933, the Nazis came to power in Germany and life became increasingly difficult for German Jews. Anti-Jewish legislation was passed which denied Jews many freedoms and restricted their rights, starting with removing them from certain professions and schools and universities. The Nuremberg Laws in 1935 restricted who Jews could marry and went further than that. They defined anyone who had three or four Jewish grandparents as a Jew, regardless of whether or not that person saw themselves as Jewish. With that, freedom of religion and freedom to self-identify were removed. In time, other freedoms were stripped away. Freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom to reproduce, and ultimately, the freedom to live. So I'm pleased that we're joined by Barbara Warnock from the Wiener Holocaust Library this evening. And in a moment, I'll hand over to our chair, my colleague, Dr. Lisa Peschel, who's a senior lecturer here at the University of York. I know that we're all very interested to hear more about Ruth Wiener and her important story, which you always hope would help us all to better understand how we can better protect the many fragile freedoms that we enjoy, whilst reflecting on the restrictions and lack of freedom that so many face today around the world. I hope you'll now join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Peschel from our School of Arts and Creative Technologies. Before coming to York, Lisa held postdoctoral fellowships at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and the Center for Jewish Studies at Harvard University. She has a special interest in identity and subjectivity, trauma, humor, and the roles that theatrical performance plays for societies in crisis. Thank you, and welcome to Lisa. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's talk. I'm grateful to our Vice Chancellor for his thought-provoking introduction and his kind introduction of me. As he said, my name is Lisa Peschel. I'm a senior lecturer in theater, and my research is on theatrical performance during the Holocaust in the Jewish ghetto called Theresienstadt, or in Czech, Terezin. And through that research, I've had the privilege of participating in events hosted by the Wiener Library and of researching in their excellent archival collections. So it is truly my great pleasure to chair this evening's talk. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Barbara Warnick is the Senior Curator and Head of Education at the Wiener Holocaust Library, where she has curated the exhibitions Jewish Resistance to the Holocaust, Berlin, London, The Lost Photographs of Gerti Simon, and Forgotten Victims, The Nazi Genocide of the Roma and Sinti, among, among others. She is the author of the book Berlin, London, The Lost Photographs of Gerti Simon, a Spectator Book of the Year in 2019, and of a number of articles on Jewish refugee history and the Nazi persecution of Roma. She obtained her doctorate in Austrian history from Birkbeck College, University of London in 2016. She was for many years a history teacher and examiner. So it is my pleasure to welcome you and over to you, Barbara. 
Thanks very much, Lisa, for that very kind introduction. Um, and also thank you very much to the University of York and everybody involved in um, inviting me here tonight. I'm really pleased to be speaking to you. Um, and I'm actually speaking to you from the Wiener Holocaust Library in central London. We're in Russell Square near the British Museum. For those of you that know know that, I'm not actually in the, re the lovely reading room we have itself. I'm just in my... Um, office, but I am in the library. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is um, talk to you a bit about the history of the institution and the collections that we've got, and then hone in on, on one particular family and one particular um, individual story as well to, to, to look at the effect that this period had on one young woman's life and her, her family life. So that that's where I'm kind of going to going to go today and I'm going to be using documents that are from our archival collections to tell this story. So one thing I hope to kind of achieve today is, is just to sort of give you a sense of how um, important the historical documents are often in, in being able to tell historical stories. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. I've got lots of different sources and so on to show you. So I've got a, a selection of some of the photographs here and documents that I'll, I'll be featuring tonight. So you can see there our name, the Wiener Holocaust Library. Um, and the library's name comes from our founder, Dr. Alfred Wiener. It's it's not actually to do with Vienna or anything like that. It's just, just his, his name. But as you can hear, he pronounced it the German way. And there's Dr. Wiener. And he was a German Jew. And he was born in Potsdam outside of Berlin in 1885. And Alfred Wiener, before the First World War, was planning to become an academic, and one of his specialisms was actually medieval Arabic literature. He did a PhD um, connected with that. But then, as with so many people, his life was altered by the First World War. He was conscripted into the, the army, the German army, and he served with distinction and won an Iron Cross for brave service. After the war, Alfred Wiener started to work for the largest organisation representing Jews in Germany. And he also became very concerned about the upsurge in anti-Semitism that there was in the context of post-First World War Germany. And as early as 1919, he published an analysis of this. And you can see um, a copy that we have in the library of this, this analysis. It was called Vor Pogromen before pogroms with a question mark. And in this pamphlet, 1919, um, Alfred Wiener looked at um, anti-Semitic groups in Germany, their rhetoric, their sources of funding and so on. And he warned uh, that ultimately this activity might lead to an orchestrated violent attack on Germany's Jewish community. This is what he was worried about as early as 1919. So, through the uh, 1920s and early 1930s, part of Wiener's work remained analysing anti-Semitism in Germany, speaking out about it. And from the later 1920s, that work was very much focused on anti-Nazi work, on gathering documentation about Nazi party activities, on trying to assemble kind of counter propaganda or counter uh, materials to um, challenge the Nazi party and try and stop their rise. So when the Nazis um, acceded to power in January 1933, by this point, Alfred Wiener was really known as an anti-Nazi campaigner. And because of that, was not really safe. And so he became one of the earlier refugees from Nazism um, and was essentially threatened um, um, by the regime and, and really had to leave for his own safety. And so he relocated in 1933 to um, Amsterdam, and there he founded the uh, predecessor organization of the Wiener Holocaust Library, and we have a continuous history with this organization. The decision was taken in 1933 to set this organization up, and it opened in early 1934, which is why we're saying at the moment it's our 90th anniversary. Um, and you can see there a picture of the staff of this organization in Amsterdam in the 1930s. So the organization was called the Jewish Central Information Office, um, and it gathered evidence and information about what was going on in the Third Reich and had a very specific 
focus, though this wasn't its only focus, but a specific focus on the position of the Jewish community there. And in the photograph, you can see on the left, um, Alfred Wiener and his wife, um, Margareta, and I'll, I'll come back to Margareta in, uh, a bit later on in the talk. So there they are with the staff of the organisation. So through the 1930s, the organisation, through a network of, of contacts that it had in Germany and later Austria, um, gathered documentation and evidence about the situation in Nazi Germany, disseminated um, reports and conducted other other kind of awareness raising work. So now the focus was to try and raise awareness around the world um, about the threat of Nazism. And you can see on the right there um, a photograph of a really important set of documents that we've got in the collections. And these are eyewitness accounts um, of Kristallnacht, um, which happened, Kristallnacht happened in November 1938. And it was a very serious escalation by the Nazi regime in anti-Jewish um, activities. So it was, um, you know, rep it was an attack on uh, most of the synagogues of Germany. People's homes were attacked and ransacked. Um, there were hundreds of murders, thousands of, of violent attacks and the mass arrests of around 30,000 uh, Jewish men. Um, and so it really was a serious escalation on the way to the to the Holocaust. And our predecessor organization in Amsterdam started to receive eyewitness accounts of these events, really starting from the very first day on the 9th of November. So these are very important reports and documents um, for us. Um, shortly after that, in 1939, under pressure from um, the government in the Netherlands to kind of curtail the activities of the Jewish Central Information Office, um, attempts were made to relocate the organisation. Um, and by summer 1939, permission had been obtained from the British government to relocate to London. So um, most of the original papers in the archive were, were packed up and sent to London. Alfred Wiener himself uh, obtained a visa and came to London at that point. We've been in a few different locations in London, um, but we're currently in Russell Square, as I've mentioned. And so just a, a quick couple of photographs there to give you some sense of it. Our reading room there with books about these subjects, our extensive archives, just the photograph there, so you get some sense of, of the kind of condition of our archives, the archival boxes and so on. Um, the collections are very diverse, um, so they include documents, photographs, personal documents, all sorts of different things, Nazi documents. Um, they include um, amazing items such as on the left there, um, the most comprehensive set of documents, uh, personal documents anyway, from the Theresienstadt um, camp and ghetto that's already been, been mentioned, and um, the, these that's a very important collection that survived for us. We've got a very extensive collection to do with the experiences of Jewish refugees who came to Britain, including the documents on the right from a really small little refugee charity operating in Britain in the late 1930s. We've got extensive collections to do with um, childhood in Nazi Germany. Um, and that's an example, this is an example of a Hitler Youth colouring book that we have in, in the collection. And we've got very extensive documentation about um, anti-Semitism um, and anti-Semitic policies in Germany in the 30s, including this horrific um, board game that we've got in our current exhibition that marks our 90th anniversary. And this board game is called Jews Out. It's really quite disturbing. And the aim of the game is to drive the Jews represented in hor horrific caricatured form out of this, this kind of German German town. Um, so this is just just a really tiny snapshot of of some of what we've got in the in the collections. Um, and if you want to find out more, we do have currently an exhibition looking at our 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 highlights from our collections. So um, today I'm going to focus on one family story, and that is the family story of of the Venus themselves, of our, of our founders' family. And specifically, be looking um, mostly at the the Alfred, at Alfred Wiener's oldest daughter, um, Ruth. And in putting together this um, presentation and and um, other things that we've done recently for our 90th anniversary, um, we've drawn upon 
certain collections that we've got that have been very generously donated to us um, by descendants of Alfred and Margareta Wiener. So um, these are document collections from the Finkelstein family and also um, from the Clemens family. So we're very grateful to them for these donations and their support for our work. So selection of photographs, as I say, of Alfred um, and Margareta and their, their, their family. So this Margareta um, Vina on her wedding day, um, she she was um, Salman um, and was her was her her, her uh, maiden name, and she was married in 1921. And she was um, like Alfred, a doctor. Um, uh, she was an economist, and she also was engaged in anti-Nazi work. So in the 1920s, she particularly focused on critiquing Nazi economic policy, as that was her area of expertise. So. Um, that's um, a lovely sort of personal family picture of her there. And in terms of the family, um, firstly, uh, Alfred and Margareta had a son, Carl. It's a lovely picture of him there. Um, he was born in 1922, but, but unfortunately, in uh, lived till 1928, he died of an appendicitis. So they lost their... Um, their oldest child, a, a source of continued sadness, obviously, for them. Um, they they went on to have three daughters. So Ruth on the left there, born in 1927, Ava born in 1930, and then uh, Miriam born in 1933. And the photograph there is Berlin in 1933. This, this moment of great stress, I think, for the parents of Ruth and Ava, photographed there in a park in Berlin, um, I assume it's it's kind of summertime. Um, and by this point, uh, Alfred Wiener, you know, was ta already taking steps to leave, was up, on, his, on his way to, to moving to Amsterdam. Um, he actually initially on the Nazi accession to power kind of had a, a bit of a breakdown, really. He was so kind of stressed out at um, really his 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 life's work reaching this point where the the nazis were um actually in power so but you know he kind of got himself together and then relocated to amsterdam and set up the the organization i've just mentioned so um the young family were then in amsterdam and ruth the oldest daughter um quickly adapted to her new life so she excelled in school she learned dutch very quickly um, she joined swimming clubs and other kind of organisations as well. So she had a very sort of full, active, busy life in school. And this is, a, a, you know, quite charming photograph of the three three girls there um, together in Amsterdam. And we've got quite a few documents and items and photographs that that record the family life at this period. Alfred Wiener was extremely busy with his work, Margareta was supporting him, but also very much the person left um, in charge of the kind of family and the, the domestic life. Um, but the girls seem to report, you know, very happy time in the main in this period in Amsterdam, um, at school and in other places. And we've got in the collections a couple of what are called posy albums that were widely kept at this time. And, and they're sort of dedication albums that children would keep. So other people would write inscriptions and dedications in them to the person whose album it was. And this this is one of um, Ruth Wiener's albums here. You can see there it says Libra Ruth, dear Ruth. So um, we've got a couple of the, the these items in our collections from Ruth's childhood. And then we've also got this, which is quite interesting. Um, so. Uh, Ruth and some of her friends set up a club that was called Lust for Joy, um, which I suppose we might kind of translate that as, as a glee club. And Ruth was on the board of this organisation for, for children. And this is a little uh, membership card here. And you can see that Ruth signed it as a kind of board member, taking in a new new member from, from the local area. And the photograph there of of her on the right hand side is from 1936, and she was she was nine at the time. Um, and Ruth recalls this, as I say, as a, a, a recalled this as a, as a positive time in terms of her childhood and and family life and her life in in Amsterdam, which which she seems to have, have loved really. 
Round about this time, it's also worth noting that she became friends with, with Margot Frank and Frank's older sister. They knew each other from the community and school connections in various ways. Um, and so this was the kind of context that they were in, uh, happy in Amsterdam, and also connected with other um, German Jewish emigre families in that situation. But obviously, as we know, the situation in the Netherlands was going to get more difficult. And this photograph is from, all these photographs are from about sort of 39 um, to 40. So um, I've already mentioned um, Alfred Wiener deciding to, to that really with um, pressure from the, the Dutch government and then impending war that the the best thing to do was relocate. Um, and so there was by this kind of time, this 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 um, impending threat of um, German invasion, which was obviously particularly threatening for the Jewish community in, in the Netherlands. And, you know, those who'd actually left Germany and had a lot of connections um, back in Germany were very aware of the kind of consequences and rising persecution that would likely follow a German um, takeover. And then this photograph here is quite a striking one, but one thing that actually um, I found striking about it is the date. So we've got the three girls there. So we've got uh, Ruth, Ava and Miriam and Ruth on, on the left-hand side there, pictured on their way to school um, on the 5th of May, 1940. Um, and, you know, it's just a nice picture of girls on the way to school um, on the on the street that they lived in, and actually the street that our predecessor organisation was based in as well. Um, so obviously they're still in Amsterdam, and Alfred Wiener um, had got out, had got a visa, the organisation had relocated. So this photograph, the 5th of May, 1940, um, and then we have got a fairly recent um, acquisition to the collection, and it's this very striking document from the 6th of May, 1940. So the Wiener family had been trying to get visas um, in order to be reunited with Alfred. So Alfred had got a visa, but his wife and three daughters hadn't. And on the 6th of May, 1940, the British Passport Control Office in The Hague sent this letter to Margareta Wiener and, the, and it says, you know, I beg to inform you that I am authorised to grant visas for the United Kingdom to you and to the Misses R.H. Wiener, E. Wiener and um, M.E. Wiener, so her daughters, and then, you know, tells you to, to tells her to report to the office and, and uh, uh, kind of collect the visas in their passports. But this was the 6th of May. I mean, this was piped on the 6th of May. I don't know exactly when Margareta received it. But on the 10th of May 1940, the German invasion came and borders shut and it became very, very difficult, almost impossible for people to, to leave. And so um, the Wiener family did not obtain visas in time. It wasn't for lack of time, but they didn't manage to get the visas in time in order to get out. And they became trapped. They became stranded in the situation of um of German takeover at this point. And so what they faced was uh, ever-growing kind of radicalization of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish policy in this context. So um, just a few, this, this isn't even comprehensive, but just a few things to tell you about, to give you some sense of this, that, you know, um, a fairly initial move was a requirement for Jews to register at municip municipal offices that later in 41, Jewish children were increasingly placed in separate schools and removed from um, schools with non-Jews, that the, the requirement came that J had to be stamped on Jews' identity papers to mark them out in this way, that deportation of Jews to labour camps begun, that people were ever more um, impoverished as food rations were reduced for Jews, um, and the requirement to where yellow stars came in, and, and then deportations to death camps um, followed. So it was this, this horrific deteriorating situation in terms of both restrictions, persecution, um, transportations, and also increasing poverty. And this was the situation that, that Margareta and her, her girls found themselves in. And we've got this, this Red Cross message that Margareta sent to Alfred in this context. So, so during the war, it was quite difficult to use conventional posts. It was often um, forbidden to post things directly, for example, from 
um, Britain um, to uh, German occupied Europe. In this case, Alfred Wiener was actually in New York at this point. Um, and Margareta in Amsterdam, writing to Alfred, um, says in English, handily for us, um, the, the Wieners seem to have kind of practiced their English by always trying to write to each other in English. So she says, no chance for us to get exit exit permit. Please write to Camilla, who was somebody trying to assist them in, in, in their escape. Longing for good news from you. We're all well. Um, yours, children and Greta, which she was, no, Margaret was, was known by. And then Alfred replied on the same piece of paper that he'd heard from Camilla, this woman who was trying to aid their escape. And so sorry that I can do nothing to change separations. Best wishes forever yours, Alfred. Um, so this was the situation Margaret and her daughters found themselves in. And for Ruth, um, you know, she, the consequences would have been really quite obvious. So, for example, she had to obtain this, this card that we've got in the collection. And, and this, this is on the left-hand side, and this is um, a registration card, and it registers her as a person of holy or partly Jewish blood, is the phrase in, in, in Dutch there. So this, you know, marked her out and put her in a, more, a you know, kind of vulnerable position, obviously. And then on the right, we've got Margareta Wiener's ID card um, saying that she's a member of the Jewish um community of Amsterdam for whom she worked actually um, and again it's this kind of form of registration and the Jewish community were left with this this choice of kind of registering or trying to go underground which was very very difficult and fraught so at, at this stage the family did not do that but in the context of a deteriorating situation during the war um, they were aware of people ever creating people that they knew disappearing um, at an ever-increasing rate, which must have been a terrifying experience. And Margaret Avina kept bags packed for her and her girls um, in readiness, in expectation, really, of, of them being potentially arrested and, and deported. And, and that day did come on the 20th of June, 1943. And this is a, a document recording it that, that Ruth later wrote, recording her kind of memories of, of this um, terrifying uh, evening when they were arrested and she records what happened and also the kind of um, attendant anxiety and chaos that surrounded um, this event. And the family were sent to Vesterbork transit camp um, where later Margareta um, Vina wrote a, a really powerful letter to um, her daughter Ruth. So she wrote this letter for Ruth on the eve of her 16th birthday and she recalled things such as her own, Margareta's own 16th birthday and how different it, it had been and you know sort of made that painful contrast but also she wanted to kind of honour the support that her, her oldest daughter had always given you and given her. And so it, just a little extract from it here, from the moment that you got out of your nice warm bed on that dreadful 20th of June in the early morning and helped me so efficiently and sympathetically. And then your behaviour here under such horribly changed circumstances, you're entering a new kind of work, your love and your trust that you have showed to me, my good one, how grateful I am to you for um, everything. So that is obviously a very um, powerful um, document there um, that, that we've got and that Ruth Vina treasured from her, her mother. We've also got these more kind of bureaucratic documents as part of Ruth Vina's collection. So this is um, a, a work card from Vesterbork camp and it records the kind of work that after her 16th birthday, at which point she was classified as an adult, Ruthina was compelled to do in Vesterbork camp. So she started off as a potato harvester, then started to work in the laundry. Ruth actually took a tiny diary to the camps with her and an increasingly um, blunt and worn out pencil and tried to record whatever she could in Vesterbork camp and then later in Bergen-Belsen where they were later sent and um, she very much later produced, a, it's, very, it's quite hard to sort of make out the diary and she produced a transcript of it later on. Um, so we've got some documents here from Vesterbork, extracts from um, the diary, a, a sort of ticket relating to her work in the laundry and then a rather sort of haunting photograph of, of her there from the camp. 
And in her diary, she records various things about Vesterbork. So it's quite a useful kind of historical document, including the transportations um, that went on, um, the you know ever increasing instances of sickness, sickness in the camp, the new regulations that were introduced. So you know conditions were were very very difficult. Meanwhile, Alfred Wiener was doing various things. So he was helping to run the Jewish Central Information Office in London, which was um, funded at this point by the British government as it was recognised during the war as being, at least initially at the start of the war, by far the largest sort of source of intelligence about the Nazi movement in Britain. The British government weren't necessarily interested in the issue of anti-Semitism, but they were interested in intelligence about the Nazi regime, senior Nazis, Nazi policies and so on. So the organisation, which through the war was increasingly referred to as Dr. Wiener's Library, and we've been variations on that ever since, was in London, continuing to gather the evidence and information about the persecution of Jews and other topics. And increasingly, obviously, that meant documenting the Holocaust. Um, Wiener himself worked um, uh, doing that and also for British military intelligence. He travelled a lot. Um, he was based in New York a lot and based at Hotel Century. So this is just um, his 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 card here from his alien registration card in, from the States from this period. And he was also trying desperately to find a way to get his wife and daughters to safety. So through contacts that he had in Switzerland, he managed to help to a certain extent. And it, it certainly saved really almost certainly saved the, the girl's lives, his daughter's lives. Um, so he had this contact, Camilla, who I've mentioned, Camilla Aronofska um, in Switzerland, and she was connected with groups that were trying to obtain documentation that might um, afford Jews in camps a measure of protection. And so an initial stage of this was that Camilla Oronovska needed to obtain kind of personal details from Margareta Vina about her and her daughters in order to try and get documentation from them that might help them. So in this case, she's written to Dr. Vina, in this case, it's Margareta Vina. Um, she's written to her in Vesterbork camp in Holland, and she said, I've just learned that you've been taken to the Vesterbork camp with your children. This must be based on a mistake, she says, because thanks to the efforts of your relatives, you should get a foreign passport, i.e. a passport that would give them a different nationality other than German. Um, and, in, you know, they were kind of stateless. They'd lost their, their German citizenship by this point Jews, Jews had in, in, in Germany. So then Aronofsky says, I ask for immediate notification of your exact data, first um, names, birth dates, etc., so that I can send you the papers immediately. So it's a rather intriguing piece of correspondence in, into the camp. And the eventual result of this was the, 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 the girls and their mother obtained a Paraguayan passport. This was an illegal Paraguayan passport. The Paraguayan consul um, was essentially open to being bribed um, in order to um, get, provide passports of this nature to, to Jews in camps. And so um, Aronofsky and her contacts could fill in the details um, and then it would get an official stamp um, and it would seem to be um, an official document. So this kind of changed the Vina's status. Now, the history of all of this, it's, it's a wider history than just the Paraguayan consulate. It's quite a complicated um, situation. It, it, it's very complex, so I can't really fully kind of go in, into it here. Um, and it was widely known that these passports weren't actually legitimate, but nevertheless, it changed the, the Venus um, status and meant that they were potentially eligible to be swapped for German prisoners of war. Um, and that is, is what happened, but um, this was these were not a set of documents that um, Margaret, the rest of Margareta's family managed to obtain. And we have, again, a fairly recent acquisition in the collection. We have these very powerful little scraps of paper um, in the collection uh, written by the woman pictured there. And this is Gertrude or Truda um, Abrahams, and she was Margareta Vina's sister. She and her family, um, her husband, her son, were also 
in Vestibort camp at exactly the same time as the Venus. And by this point in 1943 in Vesterbork, there were weekly train transports to Auschwitz or Soberbor death camps. So transports of people really often, you know, straight straight to their deaths in this as part of, of the genocide. Um, and with the Venus par- sort of supposed Paraguayan status, it meant they were less likely to be selected for this. Whereas tragically, Truda and her family were selected for a transport to Sobibor. And this is their final correspondence, written in Vesterbort camp on the night before they were transported, knowing they were being transported, but not knowing to what. And um, Truda's letter to her sister is just so powerful. And what's really awful about it is it's quite optimistic. It sort of says, you know, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. I, I I believe that, you know, my experience tells me in life that things always work out in the end and that we'll be reunited. And, um, you know, her and her family were, were within days murdered in Sobibor. So it's it's very powerful and shows in some senses sometimes the kind of arbitrariness of whether people, you know, in these awful, awful circumstances survived or not. The, the, the Venus managed to just about, or at least the girls did, um, but um, this family, their close relations did not. So the Wiener family were then um, sent Margareta and her daughters to, to Belsen camp from Vesterbork. So rather than going to a death camp, they were sent to another concentration camp at Belsen. Um, and um, this was on the basis that they might be exchanged for prisoners. And you can see in her diary here from 1944, actually, Ruth, kind of used the diary in 43 and 44 and just wrote over the same pages that she's recorded her new address. And in Belson, she recorded um, the increased levels of surveillance there and intimidation, the deteriorating conditions. And she worked in the potato kitchen and then in sorting um, prisoners' um, shoes. Uh, Margareta Vina herself um, worked for a time that then became too sick and really suffered um huge health problems and also increasingly starvation as she tried to save the meagre rations that there were for her daughters. Interestingly, um, Ruth Wiener's diary records seeing Margot and Anne Frank in in the camp in 1944. It says 43, but it's 44. Um, and this is a little bit of evidence about the Frank family um, in the camp. And, you know, she knew them from back in Amsterdam. Eventually, in January 1945, release did come and the Wiener family were swapped for German German prisoners of war. It's a really, really rare, rare swap. Um, It hardly ever happened, but it did happen for them. And they were put on a train from Belsen to Switzerland. And Margareta Wiener's final act in life was to convince Nazi officials that she was well enough to travel, but she wasn't. Um, and she essentially didn't survive the journey. She she was sent to Switzerland. She became unconscious on the train and was taken to hospital in Switzerland and um, died there. So Alfred Wiener started to receive um, alarming telegrams in New York. Um, we've got a number of them in the collection, such as this one. So again, Camilla Aronofsky, your, your dear wife, Margaret, died peacefully last Thursday. So, um, yes, awful news for him. He did know very quickly that his daughters had um, survived and had made it. And there's a picture of Margaret as a young student and a little note that Ruth wrote um, about her mother um, shortly after her death. Um, so you can you can read it there and, and she sort of reflects on how her last wish was, you know, to return her girls to their father, and that had been achieved. The girls went from Switzerland to the south of France and then aboard a ship to New York, where they were finally reunited with their father, having not seen him since early 1940. So they're then in New York, which Miriam said it was as if we had landed on the moon. And Ruth then um, kept various records and and, um, accounts and diaries of of this this experience there and you know there's various photographs of them in this situation the family did not sort of get fully reunited 
Um, Vina actually had, for visa reasons, to kind of come back to Britain. The girls then had to apply to come to Britain. So it remained bureaucratically very complicated. Um, but they had a time of schooling in the States and, and Ruth did, again, exceptionally well there. They took they took very quickly to English and um, uh, Ruth very much excelled in her, her studies there. And then finally, um, they managed to come to London to be um, properly reunited. Um, Ruth studied at Birkbeck. University of London as a foreign in foreign languages and later became a foreign language teacher. And um, she she married Paul Clemens, and this is her wedding day in 1950. And the family settled in um, Australia and then later um, the United States. We've got various kind of images, uh, post-war images there of the family. And so just really to, to sort of conclude the nice picture of Ruth there, this picture of the exterior of the Wiener Library's building there. So, you know, in order to kind of piece this history together, together and tell you this picture, this story of an individual family, but also that points to obviously so much about the wider complex history and tragic history of this time. Um, you know, it's, it's been made, it's made possible by the donations of family papers that we get. So thank you once again to the descendants um, of, of the Venus for these, these donations that make this possible. So we have our 90th anniversary exhibitions at the moment. Um, you can find out more on our website. Um, and then there's just this link, obviously, if it'll open to the 90th anniversary exhibitions. Um, so please do come and visit us if, if you can. Okay, so I'll stop there. Barbara, thank you very much for this fascinating tour of the institution's history and also the quite moving personal story of the family. And those of you listening, please do feel free to put questions in the chat. And I believe the link to the Wiener Library, those internet links will be put back up in the chat. So those of you who didn't catch them on the slide, you will be able to get them from the chat before this talk ends. I'd like to start with one question from the audience. And I'm also quite intrigued by this question because you did talk about this kind of pattern of, of emigration of German Jews to Amsterdam when the situation in Germany started to become dangerous. And as we know, Anne Frank's family, they were German Jews. Many of the people who ended up in Westerbork were actually German Jews rather than Dutch Jews. Um, Lena in our audience asks, the staff in Amsterdam, the staff of this early predecessor of the Wiener Library, were they Dutch or German Jews? They were they were German, um, yes, and the same was true when we moved to London. That the early staff were in the main German, sometimes Austrian, um, uh, Jewish, yeah, refugees from Nazism, basically. And so that that does kind of affect our institutional history because that's been that was the perspective from which the organisation was founded, and it also has affected our collections because they kind of overrepresent. Uh, German and Austrian stories. And there's lots mm -hmm. of reasons for that. It's not just about our institutional history. It's also about where it was easier for Jews. Well, easy sounds an awful word because it wasn't easy to escape. And as you can see, you know, Margaret Avina didn't. Um, but, um, you know, people in communities further east, it was much harder um, and so the doc, you know, the the doc, doc we didn't, there isn't, there wasn't the same kind of number of refugees that then might have preserved documents that might donate them to an archive. So um, we can tell a lot of stories about German, not Germany, German and Austrian Jewish families, sometimes Czech families, occasionally Polish families, but very rarely of, um, say, um, Jewish families from further east, from Soviet territories, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question from our audience, from Joe Oliver. Where did the funding for the Wiener Library come from? The Wiener Library in the UK during the war, was some of the funding independent? Was there any government funding? How was Alfred Wiener able to support his activities? 
Yes, so mostly with government funding. And then when the government cut that off, and I think I think it was 1944, that was tricky. That was really difficult. So by um, the late part of the war, the British government felt that, you know, their own intelligence about the Nazis and the Nazi movement meant they didn't really need the library anymore. Whereas, you know, in, in the early part of the war, they had felt that they needed the library um, or the Jewish Central Information Office, as it was then known. Um, the... The organisation, when it was in Amsterdam, had been supported by other Jewish organisations worldwide, but particularly the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And so I suspect there was some support coming through from, from the Board of Deputies of British Jews, actually, as well, uh, with whom we worked very closely in, the, in those years. Keep getting plenty of questions coming through. I'll just keep asking. Um... On behalf of Katie Wilson, what reception did the library receive in Amsterdam and in London when those libraries were originally set up? Um, well, I think the, the situation in Amsterdam was initially not too bad. I don't know too much about this, but I, I certainly know that I think as I mentioned that, that the the position, in a sense, got more tricky. So the, 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 the Dutch government were trying to maintain a position of neutrality. Um, and so as the um, anti as anti-Semitic measures, you know, gradually kind of escalated in, in Germany through the 1930s, um, then that became more of an issue as as war maybe became more likely that became more of an issue. So this led to this pressure from from the Dutch government, as I understand it, to on the organisation to kind of keep a lower profile to to um, be less active, which was one of the factors in provoking them to try and relocate. The organization did try and keep fairly clandestine um, mm. uh, it, for, for its own protection. So it issued reports, um, for example, giving really extensive information about Kristallnacht, um, but would send them to journalists and so on and um, and say, please don't, uh, please don't acknowledge your source you know it would mm -hmm. it, it it really did try and kind of protect itself as far as possible um in mm -hmm. london um you know there, there were there were it it it, it, it opened its doors on the 1st of september 1939 of all dates so i can't imagine anyone noticed um really very much <laughs> um, but the british government were aware of the organization and shortly you know, quickly started to fund it, and and organisations with con connections like the Board of Deputies must have known. But I think at that point it would have more been something known by certain circles of people, and by the British government, civil service, and very much also by kind of German and um, Austrian emigre communities as well, with whom we had these mm -hmm. these contacts. With, you know, we also had contacts with other emigre organizations as well. So um, those kind of circles, I, I don't think the profile would have been that high at that point. Mm, yeah, out of necessity, trying to keep a low profile for much of these, many of these early years. Um, a question from Silu Pasco. It, it is quite amazing how much Ruth was able to hang on to, how many of her personal items she was able to keep. How did that happen, considering their path through the camps? How were these items preserved? Well, she must have just taken great care to preserve them. But yes, it, it, it wouldn't have been everybody's priority. Um, <laughs> I mean, I suppose most of the objects are small and flimsy and fairly weightless and not, you know, not obvious or bulky, but it also must have been a priority for her. And I do wonder if that it was sort of showing an influence from her father that the family were very conscious of the the, the desirability in a sense of maintaining records and preserving records, partly for yourself, but also for memory for historical for the historical record as well. Because you know that was the work that her father had been engaged in. So um, mm -hmm. I do wonder if that was partly something that was a kind of family culture of that. But I think yeah. it just shows her priorities. A lot of people, obviously, it wouldn't have been a priority to keep or maintain records in, in this context. And another question about the family. Did Alfred Wiener have any prior ties to the Netherlands before choosing to move there? I think he had contacts, um, which made it a place that was more you know, of interest to go. Um, but also, I think it's just the proximity as well um, that led a lot of the early refugees from Nazism to go to 
um, the Netherlands and Belgium and sometimes France, you know, rather than further afield as maybe later, slightly later people tried tried to do. But the initial kind of refugees were were, were going, you know, they weren't going all that far in, ter- in, their, in their journeys in Europe. Okay. And also, I'm, I'm not sure where this was mentioned, but someone is asking that Ruth mentions in January 1944 that the Terrazine group are here in Belzen. I think that um, must have been in, in the diary. I didn't particularly mention it, but I, it must yeah. have been in the translated extract. Okay, yeah, well, well, um, well spotted, Silu. So the question, the question is, how did she know about them? I'm intrigued with this as well. Did people, did word spread quite quickly when different national groups arrived in Belzen? Do you have any idea how she would have known? I don't really know. No, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I mean, I suppose people, people, you know, she was a, a young woman, a young, intelligent, observant woman who was working mm-hmm. and speaking to others and moving around the camp. So, um, yeah. but I don't know precisely. Yeah, I must, I imagine it must have been quite a clandestine gossip network in the camp. Yes, and, yes, sort of, like that would... and particularly to those out, you know, doing at, at work. Her younger sisters were um, confined to, to barracks, um, whereas she was out and about working. So she would have obviously encountered far more people and far more news. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you know, Lena is asking if Ruth Wiener kept her knowledge of the German and Dutch language. Did she continue to use those languages throughout her life? Um, Well, she became a languages teacher, so I think so. And she later... Um, was able to translate her own diary from Dutch to English. So I, I think mm-hmm. so, yes. Yeah. And do what is the involvement of descendants of the family with the library today? Um, so um the the they're all very supportive. So as I say, we've had these these document donations, um, but also um the Finkelstein family who are based in London, um, you know, come into events and speak on um, for us. Um, so some of you may be aware that Alfred Wiener's grandson, Daniel Finkelstein, published an amazing book about all these stories last year, which um, I'd recommend, which also explores his father's own story during this period, which is its own kind of mind-blowing story. So he he was the, the he is the son of Mary. I'm the youngest daughter. And um, so yes, he he was very supportive in putting together our 90th anniversary exhibitions and kind of advised me on that and has done events for us and um so they're, they're very very supportive we're actually i maybe should, should have mentioned this earlier but um uh next week the library is in amsterdam um for holocaust memorial day and just before the exact 90th anniversary of of the the jci op- opening its doors and this is to lay a number of stolpersteiner so these are stumbling mm. stones you translate them as so these some of you may be aware of these little cobbles almost that are inserted into pavements and roads outside of properties that people um were kind of tran- usually it's where people were sort of transported um arrested from um mm-hmm. so in the case of um what we're doing next week this is a stolpersteiner to margaret avina outside her home in Amsterdam. Um, and the, the the Finkelstein family are all um, going to be um, present for, for that. Um, so yes, yes, very supportive of, of the work. And I should also say that there's two other Stolpersteiner going in um, next week with that. And, and th- these are two, um, two of our original members of staff um, who also didn't manage to obtain visas in time it was seem or didn't um, manage to use them in time I think the story is somewhat murky but um you know who were ultimately murdered in the Holocaust so there's also going to be mm-hmm. a plaque to them um and or stumbling stones to them and a plaque also talking about the JCIO and the, and its history on the street as well and it, it was a street and if for, if anyone has read Daniel Finkelstein's book you'll read about this in more detail um but um, there was quite a concentration of Jewish families in the area. And, um, you know, to read, as he documents the fate of many of, 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 of um, the girls' friends on those streets and what happened to them. And, you know, it's it, it's very distressing. Um, 
So it, it's an area in which a lot of people were arrested and um, transported from. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad to hear about the the Stolperstein events coming up. And and someone has actually asked in the questions how that is spelled. So Naomi, maybe you'd be able Stolperstein, to Stolperstein, right? Hang on. The chat. <laughs> S G O L P E R S T E. Have I got that right? E I N. E, if it was yeah. plural. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of information on the internet about those because, yeah, I've seen those all over Europe. There are many in yes. Prague and in other Czech cities for people who perished in the Theresienstadt camp or in yes. other camps. So this is this wonderful that this recognition is going to take place. And, and I would like to just. Many in Amsterdam. So it's particularly good. Oh. And, you know, it, one thing I didn't mention was that. Um, the Netherlands were a particularly awful place to be, actually, compared to Bel certainly Belgium and France, that the proportion mm -hmm. of Jews who were, were of the Jewish community and the Jews living there who were murdered in the Holocaust was much higher than the proportion in Belgium and France for lots of complicated reasons. Um, but, yeah, there aren't that many Stolpersteiner in Amsterdam, and yet a lot of people were arrested and deported. But occasionally, you can, mm -hmm. if you're ever walking in central Amsterdam and you look down, I, I have, last time I was there, I did, just stumble upon one as you're supposed to. I did just happen to look down yeah. and there was there was one. So they are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope this will be the beginning of a of a wave of more. And I'd just like to acknowledge one more comment that's come up in the questions that Sue Clemens is with us. Oh well, fantastic. Previously... Hello, Sue. Thank you yeah. for coming. Yeah, previously someone asked about the involvement of the family. So this is this is the daughter, Susan. Uh and she she does note that yeah that um, that her mother did speak German until the end of her life, but she says she didn't like to speak it to her kids because it reminded her of the Nazis. So yeah, a yes. complex relationship with that language. Yes, but, yes, very much. Um, Thank you, yeah. Sue. Yes. And with that personal note from the family, um, we'll wrap up this evening. Barbara, thank you very much for okay. joining us and for this insight into the library and into the Wiener family. And I see the link to the library has been put up in the chat. So any of you in the audience, if you'd like to find out more about the library, please do visit the website. And once more, Barbara, thank you very much for joining us Lisa. this evening. Hey, thanks everyone.